Bonsoir à tous. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, let's get straight to the point. Tonight is a very special debate, and of course, the FIFDH for the last 20 years has been uh, proposing you, offering these de debates, talking about humanitarian um, situations, which are often very, very difficult. And that's really one of the reasons why this festival exists. Um, but this really is even a special night for the festival, because uh, the war that uh, we're talking about um, is just uh, one is, 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 is not too far away from where we are. And it might even spread into Europe. And of course, uh, because of the fact that we're not too far away, we feel even more concerned. And the risk, of course, is one of double standards, of um, doing something here that we wouldn't do um, for others or for a conflict taking place somewhere else, uh, or even tolerating practices um, that we ourselves uh, do even further away. And then there is the shock. Um, we're all shocked, I think. Uh, we heard never again uh, in Europe, but uh, we've now come to realize that it is possible, even in Europe. And then the shock of the images, the pictures that we're seeing, the uh, fact is that we identify with what we are seeing. Europeans are taken to the streets as refugees, and it could even happen to us. And I, I, I'm saying us because we are in Geneva, in Europe, and uh, we are now seeing refugees within Europe, uh, and we see that that is possible. So, for all of these reasons, tonight uh, is a different debate, whether we like it or not. Uh, so, of course, there will be emotion, and uh, we're also they're going to try to reflect and try and take a bit of distance, take a step back and look at the implications of this conflict um, today and in the future uh, on human rights in particular. Of course, it's a special debate as well because it's being uh, transmitted uh, in uh, live to Bratislava in Slovakia, thanks to our One World Documentary F Festival partner. And we will also have Eva uh, Kriva Silva, who is the director of the festival there, um, who should be on the screen. You hear me? I think so. I see myself. Uh, my name is Eva from Slovakia, from the festival One World. I would like to thank very much to Geneva Film Festival to, for this opportunity to, to join this event. As you know, Slovakia is the closest neighbor of Ukraine and, uh, and still so lucky to be part of European Union. And we would like to express our compassion and our solidarity to our friends and our colleagues, filmmakers, and also, of course, others. So we are here tonight with our audience of the festival. We are ready to learn a lot of information from this panel and also to ask questions. So I would like to encourage especially Slovak audience to ask questions on Facebook under this streaming, and I will share it with uh, the panelists. Uh, thank you very much again, and good luck with the discussion. Thank you to you, Eva, and on revient à Genève très pratique. And coming back to Geneva. We're not going to stay in Geneva for too long, actually, because we are going to go to Ukraine in a moment to hear from somebody there, and then we're going to go to Russia to hear from somebody there. And we're going to talk about the different aspects of this conflict with a number of specialists who are going to join us uh, on the stage a little bit later on. You'll see that there are quite a few uh, chairs uh, here on the stage, and we're going to deal with a whole range of aspects uh, connected with international law, geopolitics, human rights, history. Uh, we'll be as brief. Uh, as we can, and it could be frustrating for some of our experts, but the idea is to try to understand something about this conflict and then um, allow you uh, in the audience to ask questions, because with uh, a conflict that is so close, we thought this was a good opportunity to give you the chance to ask questions to our experts, and hopefully they'll be able to reply to some of the questions uh, that you might have. So, getting straight to the point, 
Let's go to Ukraine to hear from a Ukrainian journalist who's been in Kiev uh, over the past few days and is now in Lviv um, to join us live. Lovely, she is there. Good evening, and thank you so much for being with us. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me tonight with you. It's a great honor to be the part of this uh, event. My name is Anna, I'm a journalist. Um, I used to work for a Ukrainian TV company, uh, but on 24th of uh, February, my life uh, stopped and actually stopped the life of many, many Ukrainians. Uh, as you know, at 4 a.m. on 24th of February, uh, Russia started its full invasion to Ukraine. I must say that uh, we were expecting that uh, sooner or later uh, Russian authorities would want to take not only the Donetsk region and the Crimea, but also to start this full invasion. But uh, for all of us uh, people, it was still a shock. Uh, it was obvious from the first day of war that uh, Russian soldiers are aiming not only military objects, they were aiming from the first day of war as civil objects. And uh, for example, they, they, uh, they were shooting at the uh, Child's Hospital on the second day of war. Uh, the rocket fell on the orphanage house uh, close to Kiev. I know exactly because I used to uh, help this orphanage house. Um, many, many families with children who were trying to flee from Kiev, for example, or from other cities, they were shot to death and uh, many children died. From the start of uh, war, according to the UN data, its official data, and uh, uh, maybe uh, it's, it's less than in reality, but according to official data, more than 400 civilians died. It includes uh, 38 children. So it means 400 ruined lives. Um, uh, so it's been 11 or 12 day of war. I can't remember exactly because it seems like the one horrible day to me. And uh, uh, I must underline that um, so many children were hurt, so many families suffer at this precise moment that it's so hard to talk about this, but I, I want the world to know about these war crimes, because it's indeed the war crimes. Uh, many, many nice uh, cities of Ukraine are just destroyed by uh, these bombs. Uh, all the suburbs of Kyiv are destroyed. A nice city, Kharkiv, is half destroyed. Sumy, a very nice region of Ukraine, is destroyed. Um, according to the previous negotiations with Russian authorities, um, well, they negotiated that the Russians will provide the Green Corridor from Mariupol. And yet, uh, uh, never mind these, these negotiations, uh, uh, the Russians didn't provide this green corridor. So in many, many cities of Ukraine at this very moment, people do not have electricity, water, food, and they're suffering. So uh, it's unprecedented, I think, in the 21st century to have uh, to, to, uh, to be the witness of such uh, crimes. Uh, I would like to underline that um, we Ukrainians uh, never wanted to, you know, to be aggressive to, to any other country. And we all, our lives have stopped on 21st of February and we keep asking, what did we do? Why, why did we deserve it? Uh, we consider it to be a genocide because uh, because we're dying only for being uh, Ukrainians. Thank you so much.
Restez volontiers encore avec nous. Do stay with us just a few minutes more if you can. Um, we're just going to show some of the pictures that you've sent us, and then I'll come back to you with uh, just one or two questions, um, if uh, that's okay. Let's have a look at the pictures. Вот вам. Что происходит? Что мне показывают по новостям? Россияне. Ce sont quelques images que j'ai sélectionnées parmi d'autres. I chose those uh, few bits of film from a whole range of pictures that we received, but I think it's uh, quite uh, um, impactful to see um, the impact of an explosive device in an urban uh, civilian area. And the question I wanted to ask you um, was uh, in relation to what you were saying earlier. You're a Ukrainian journalist and you've been uh, around the country in different regions and perhaps you can explain exactly where, but um, are these things that you've seen first hand? Uh, and could you explain a little bit about what you've seen? Because, um, of course, there is an information war going on as well. Do I get the translation? Oh. You did, you, pas, you did not get the translation, okay. You can't hear the interpretation. Okay. Can you hear us? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. I was just saying that I wanted you to, again, say and explain you are a journalist for Ukrainian, working in Ukraine. You traveled around the country. You witnessed firsthand what you explained us before, and I just want you to stress that because we know we are in a context with a war over information also, and so it has, it's very important to explain how you managed to get this information, what you saw, everything you explained us is something that you saw uh, yourself. Uh, if, I, if I'm correct, you want me to explain what I saw myself, right? Yeah, and how, where you were, what you saw, kind of explain of the, the job you did in order to gather the information, yeah. Okay, okay, stop me, stop me if I didn't understand you correct, but so far, uh, so from what I saw, from what I know, my, like my personal uh, experience of this horrible war. Uh, the first night of war, uh, many, many uh, Ukrainians who live in Kyiv, Kharkiv, uh, Sumy, and me, myself, we spent in the metro station because of the severe bombing. It was so dangerous to be outside, uh, to be in the apartments that we st spent this night in the, uh, in the bomb shells, who had bomb shells close to the uh, um, apartments or in the metro stations. Uh, uh, women who were pregnant uh, couldn't get to the hospital, so they were given birth to children in the metro station. Thanks God, it all went successfully, but I think the whole situation uh, is against the human rights in the 21st century. On the third day of war, I uh, got the uh, message from, uh, from the family I knew. There was a boy and a girl, and they were about to marry. They were living in the cottage house uh, close to Kiev, 20 kilometers from Kiev. And so that uh, very day they were about to hide in the, in the bomb shelter, but the guy, I think, he went to take something from the, from the room. And so this very moment the rocket entered, hit this house, and this boy died. We, we knew this family. Uh, also, the orphanage house, which I mentioned, uh, the boy, uh, the child died there. And it was the for, orphanage for very little kids, from like babies till uh, five uh, years old. So, uh, yes, I may say that 
I didn't see it myself with my own eyes, but I witnessed this because I know this orphanage. Uh, there were so many um, examples of these crimes all over Kiev, my native city. Uh, which I uh, had to, I had to leave my my native city and now I'm in Lviv uh, because uh, every moment uh, in Kiev people are waiting that the rocket the bomb may enter their building their home their flat and many have also um, many have already uh, lost their homes their cars and their families everything so I think that uh, the lives of many, many uh, people already in 12 days have been ruined to like it stopped. So, and it's been only 12 days and we don't know what's coming next. Uh, uh, we Ukrainians are strong and I must say I'm proud to be Ukrainian. So we are fighting, fighting hard, but uh, I feel so sorry for ladies with little children. These children, they don't cry anymore. Uh, they hear the, these uh, alarms, they hear the bombing. They don't cry anymore because they're experiencing so much stress. They cannot even cry. Uh, so that's what I can tell from, from my experience, from what I hear from my dearest friends, from, my, uh, from all of my dearest relatives. Merci beaucoup pour ce... Thank you so much uh, for that testimony. Very moving testimony. Of course, it's never easy to be a journalist in a country at war and to have to try to cover the conflict um, when it's happening to you yourself and perhaps even to your family. So that was a very moving testimony that we've just heard. So as I said, we were going to hear from Ukraine, but we're going to hear from um, Russia as well. The state of Russia has, of course, waged this war on Ukraine, but there's also a lot of shock in Russia. People woke up one morning to discover that uh, their country had invaded a neighboring country. And perhaps you can imagine that not everyone agrees with that. And there could be severe consequences on people in Russia as well. In Moscow, we have with us Irina Sherbakova, who is a Russian historian and the founding member of Memorial uh, International, which is uh, one of the pillars of Russian civil society, an NGO uh, fighting against the Russian repression. Um, or at least it was until it was dissolved, I believe. So thank you so much for being with us tonight. Good evening. Ma première question est presque trop simple. J'ai dire, mais quel est votre sentiment aujourd'hui Comment est-ce que vous êtes réveillé à la mi-juillet Да, секундочку, я просто хочу проверить то, что у нас передача есть для слушателей. Вы имели традукцию? Okay, never. I think it's okay now. Okay, please, I'm asking to repeat the question then. So, what do you feel today, given the situation that you're seeing? Could you ask? Could you ask in Russian? 
I won't be able to speak Russian all the time. I was just asking yes about your feelings what 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 are you feeling right now okay I see it's very difficult to talk about this and in Russia it's almost impossible because of course I have worked in the organization called memorial for a very long time we have been criticizing Putin's regime 2014 when Crimea was the next when the war in Donbass has started Memorial was criticizing these actions and we were warning against this politics but even we were we couldn't have imagined that such a war could could begin and this was a complete shock to us and it's just you cannot compare with anything what is happening right now i'm a historian and this is just inconceivable even was the war between the red army and the white and we had also a war with finland 939 but what is happening now the scale of it the attack on an independent state with a 40 million population. This is a full-scale war, and we were just unable to imagine anything like that. So you can imagine what we are feeling right now. The most horrible thing is, of course, we are feeling helpless because Memorial has issued a, a declaration and there were many other personalities, associations who were criticizing this. Many authors, writers, different, different societies of there were scientists film directors, many have denounced this word, decried it, and the memorial also criticized it very harshly. But we have to face the truth. We are the minority. And the statistics by social scientists it is hard to face it because we, we are seeing that there are many people in Russia who have been influenced by this horrible propaganda. It has been lasting for decades and this propaganda is very aggressive, very nationalistic. It's an imperialistic propaganda. And this propaganda was also directed against Ukraine, against the West on the whole. We don't need your Western values. We don't need democracy. That's what the propaganda has been saying. And there was this idea of the Russian world, of greater Russia, that has to unite now. And this idea has been, imp has been imposed on people. And also the propaganda has been saying that Ukraine is full of Nazis and we have to denazify this country. This is a very aggressive, horrible propaganda. And what I have been witnessing in Moscow on the streets, I have to admit that there are many people that believe in this propaganda and they believe that otherwise we would have been attacked, NATO would have attacked us, that the Americans wanted to attack us. Uh, that's why we were forced to start this war. Unfortunately, this is true, people think like that. And the economic consequences of this war we are feeling it right now, immediately. Ruble has just fallen by a third. This is just incredible. The whole economy in Russia is suffering incredibly these last days. There are different outlets and sh shops, Kikea, for example, that have closed. 
and people have, have been panicking these last days. They went to IKEA, for example, to buy furniture instead of going to protest against the war, taking to the streets. But still, we have people who take to the streets to protest, but these are mostly young people and they are the minority. And this is such a shame because Ukrainians are being bombed. They are dying under these shellings. And they are saying, Russians, why don't you take to the streets? Why are you allowing all of this? But the thing is, even those who want to go, who want to protest, they know this, uh, they will be just beaten. And yesterday, for example, it was really horrible. People are imprisoned for 30 days, for two weeks. You cannot even imagine how Moscow looks like right now the city center as if the a war is about to start in Moscow. Everywhere we see police officers, streets are being blocked. And this is all aimed against this small group of young people who want to take to the streets, who want to protest, and they are doing this. They are spreading flyers, but the atmosphere is just really scary. And many Russians uh, are leaving the country. Those who can't do it, they are doing it. And we are seeing that there are almost no connect flight connections left. But if people still can leave the country, they do it. They go by car, They, especially young men who can be uh, subscribed to the army, they try to leave. Thank you very much for that testimony. I have a question for you. You said you were a minority in Russia uh, to uh, be opposing uh, this war. Can you explain um, how the propaganda has been so effective? It seems to be working in favor of a certain political model. But when you get involved in a war with a neighboring country that is being presented as a, a brotherly country, how do you control the narrative of that propaganda and that situation? It's uh, really a very old story and it hasn't started today. This is an imperialistic approach, nationalistic narrative. This patriotism, we are proud of our victories of our country. This hatred and mistrust to everyone who thinks that there were many things in the Russian and Soviet history, you cannot be proud of them. And gradually, this propaganda has been increasing and building up. And my organization, Memorial, has seen that the figure of Stalin has been revived. And the main idea of this propaganda is a very strong state very strong state that can do anything and has the right to do anything. And this state sees a human being just as an object that has to obey, has to do anything the state wants them to do. A human being is nothing and the state is everything. And when this ideology has been created, Naturally, they have revived the image of Stalin because the most horrible symbol of such a state is, of course, Stalin. And so Memorial saw it as a very important sign, as an omen, because the image of Stalin was rehabilitated. They have created a new cult of Stalin. New monuments to Stalin were installed and they weren't talking about his repressions, about his terror, or they started justifying his terror. Um, um, 
There have been attempts, at the beginning they were very weak attempts to annex other territories. We are talking about Ukraine right now, but do you remember the summer 2007 and Georgia, the Russian army has almost reached Tbilisi back then and they were justifying it, they were defending South Ossetia and Abkhazia. After that, there was Crimea's annexation 2014. After that, Donbass and Donetsk. And already back then, after Crimea, they have started a very active propaganda against the Ukrainians. They, they were saying, do you want a Maidan here as well? They were saying they have this Maidan, this revolution. They are fascist. Fascists came to power in Ukraine. And they were creating this anti-Ukrainian discourse, this narrative. And this was extremely dangerous because many Russians were welcoming Crimea's annexation and were happy about that. And back then, we thought we are so lonely, I mean, those who were against. In the shop or on the street, we, I was talking to people and they, they were saying, finally Russia has got Crimea back. And no one wanted to hear that this would have very bad consequences. Also, so we have we were facing this aggressive anti-Ukrainian propaganda, and this has been done uh, throughout these years, and now we are seeing the consequences, because in Russia many Russians uh, watch state television. So gradually. We have come to this point. But although Putin has a very big support in the population and we have this very negative image of Ukraine, but even in this situation, if Putin has thought that he would have the same support in the population uh, af then after the annexation of Crimea, this is not true. First of all, this war, Ukrainians were not welcoming the Russian army. No one was happy about Russians' invasion in Ukraine. And even the Russians here, even if they tried to justify this war, there's no euphoria about it. This cannot be compared with the situation after Crimea's annexation. I am seeing that many Russians are scared. They just don't want to really think about it. They are scared. They are worried. You know, the 8th of March in Russia, it's a very important holiday. It's Women's Day. But this year, some Russians try to celebrate it. We try to continue our normal life, but this holiday, we see that the atmosphere is quite dire. People are really worried. They are extremely scared, even those who support Putin. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, live uh, testimony from Moscow. Well, hopefully. You're not the only one um, with that uh, um, view of things. I just wanted to point out uh, one more thing. She was being extremely brave because you know that laws have just been adopted in Russia to muzzle the press even more. And if you don't use the language uh, and terms proposed by the government to talk about what we would call a war and what they call a special military operation, then you can risk up to 15 years in prison. And uh, also, sentences have been uh, um, reinforced uh, for demonstrating in, in, in the streets. So it's risky. Uh, and so um, I think it's worth pointing out uh, just how uh, brave um, that was. 
encore une fois, encore un petit moment. Let's en... stay for a little bit longer in Russia because we have another testimony uh, from somebody from a different generation, a Russian journalist who lives abroad but who, by chance, was there when uh, President Putin launched this conflict. And she was convinced that people would finally um, go out into the streets and demonstrate against the regime, and the regime would fall. But uh, now, just a few days later, she's realized that that didn't happen. And I was talking to her yesterday, and we recorded our conversation. And you get the impression of someone who's really questioning her own people all of a sudden. And uh, I, I think we should listen to her. Um, we know her, but I'm not going to give her her name. Um, but we guarantee that this is an authentic testimony. So, I thought that uh, people would uh, be up in arms about this, but uh, it's very, very sad to see that people are justifying or trying to justify the war. And I'm not even sure if people really believe what they're saying. Uh, or well, people don't really understand what's going on, and they try to justify it. Or people are just sleepwalking into this situation. Just basic morality seems to have disappeared. People are just accepting these horrible, atrocious things happening. Because of the past few days, we've seen these terrible events, and the media, um, just in a few days, has been silenced. It's like a snowball effect, which has been launched, and who knows where this will end. Um, it's terrible to imagine. But uh, new laws seem to be adopted uh, every day. We've been now being threatened with 15 years imprisonment just for calling a war a war. Because we are being accused uh, of um, spreading false information about the Russian army if we call it a war. And for people who dare to demonstrate, uh, then laws are getting even stricter as well. And uh, so, like I said, who knows where this will end? It's been very shocking, and many Russian people are leaving the country. They're afraid of being imprisoned, and they don't want to be seen to be associated uh, with this state. Um, and I say state rather than a country. So, as I said, some people are leaving and some people are just wondering if uh, some kind of resistance movement will emerge. But uh, I just don't know. On the first day of the invasion, on the 24th of February, we were so shocked that it was difficult to think straight. And I actually thought that people would come out and oppose this uh, invasion and oppose the government. 
But after a few days, I realized that uh, that just wasn't going to happen, or at least not straight away, at any rate, unfortunately. So, I don't know, I hope that one day a resistance movement will emerge uh, against this uh, government, but I just don't know. But what's horrible is um, a couple of years ago, I read a document sent by the Ministry of Education to teachers asking them to organize lessons to explain the situation to their pupils. And it was horrible to read because it was just a pack of lies. Everything that was in that document was a lie, and that is the type of poison that they are trying to inject into our children. I don't know if people in Europe realize the extent of this catastrophe. We see the bombings and there have been sanctions, but uh, unfortunately I just don't know if that's enough. I understand that this could take some time and people are afraid to interf intervene, but I think maybe we just have to. I think there's a collective responsibility here on the part of everybody, on the part of the Russians, um, allowing their government to do this and to build up uh, their um, control over the past few years, uh, taking away people's rights, as they've done. So, I don't know, people are weak, I think. People are perhaps afraid. Some people try to resist, but uh, whenever they did, they were stopped or arrested, and it just wasn't uh, successful. Uh, journalists have been assassinated, politicians have been assassinated, or poisoned, or imprisoned. So whenever this happened, we just uh, thought, well, it can't get any worse. But I think perhaps it just has. And I think there is a collective responsibility on the part of um, the Russian people and on the part of Europe as well. I don't think Europe should have uh, just sat back and let them take over Crimea. Of course, no one was really happy with it, but uh, they just let it happen. And I think people should understand that what is happening is a bit like a cancer spreading. And if you let it spread for too long, then God knows where it will lead. Voilà pour ce deuxième témoignage de. So, um, that was the second testimony that you've just heard from Russia. Du moins de l'extérieur de Russie aujourd'hui, euh, nous avions décidé de leur donner. Well, we decided to um, hear that testimony because I think we need to hear these voices as well. Um, and what we're going to hear from the panel. Uh, is also issues connected with uh, uh, the issue of responsibility, collective or otherwise. Um, most people in Russia seem to be in favor of this conflict. And the question is, uh, what uh, is the propaganda that is being used to make people believe that? And uh, there is a historical context to that as well. So all of these issues we're going to deal with uh, during the panel debate. And uh, to begin with, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Corinna Vacher to the stage. Corinne Amachev, who is a professor of uh, Russian uh, and Soviet history at the University of Geneva and a director of the uh, 
Merci. Uh, Central Europe and Russia, Russian masters. Thank you very much indeed for coming and for helping us to try and put this in a historical context. Let's try to step back a bit and uh, try to understand the relationship between Russia and Ukraine. Karine, how do you feel about the testimonies that we've just heard? Just a moment, can you hear me okay? I hope the microphone is not too close to my mouth. Well, how do I feel about those testimonies? Well, it's very emotional, very moving to hear them. There were three very different uh, testimonies, but I think they were all equally strong. And I think there was a lot of bravery in all three of them. The third, uh, I thought, was a lot of desperation as well. Um, and it was very frank. I know Russia, and I know how difficult it is to operate in the, in the face of this repression. And I think that came out very clearly in that uh, last testimony. Um, the, spoke. the first testimony was, of course, very moving. It's very difficult to understand uh, or imagine what it's like to live uh, in those circumstances under the, that bombardment. Um, anyone working on uh, Russia and Ukraine et, uh, finds it difficult to imagine that Kiev is being bombed today. Most of my colleagues working on this area, um, historians or literary specialists or linguist, linguists, are just uh, so shocked because this is a brutal um, interruption into our lives and our work, into our relationship with Russia, our relationship with Russians and Ukrainians, and uh, with our friends. So it's an absolute um, shock for us, even though, of course, many of us realized uh, that uh, this was brewing for some time now, since 2014, at any rate. Thank you um, for those comments about the emotional um, side to this, and I think all experts in Russia or Ukraine um, can empathize with what you're saying there. But could you try to put this into a historical context? Yes, I'll try and do that. Of course, it's not easy to take the floor after those emotional testimonies. And um, I'm quite overcome as well by the emotion because uh, over the past 10 days, we've been following this situation um, very closely and we're in touch with um, people who we love very much and care about and who are living through very difficult circumstances. So I have prepared uh, a brief text that I'm going to read and try to overcome my emotion. And I'm going to try to remind you. Um, uh, many people ask me why I studied Russian history. Well, my um, maternal grandparents um, were born in Ukraine. Uh, their ancestors um, uh, emigrated from Germany under Catherine the Great when Catherine the Great invited foreigners to come and um, live in uh, that part of Russia. Part of the family um, moved after the revolution and others uh, lived through all of the, 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 the Soviet times. But many people in the West didn't know a lot about Ukraine. We talked about it a little bit in my family, but mainly about Russia. Part of my family, though, lived in Dnipro, uh, in the region there, in Ukraine, and some of them in Slavyansk, uh, near Donetsk, and others in Mariupol, uh, names that are cropping up too often now since 2014. When I started uh, studying Russian at the end of uh, the 1980s, the history of the Russian Empire and the, and the SSR and the USSR that we were taught was a Russian history. We were um, given this very Russo-centric uh, vision that's been adopted by many of the historic historiographers in, in the West as well. And since 1991, we started to see Ukraine as an independent country. And I was lucky because very quickly I um, was involved in uh, research projects that was basically um, involved uh, a number of trips to Ukraine. And I, that's when I really understood um, that we were seeing an emerging country. And I started to understand different visions of history as well. And that was absolutely vital for my um, uh, training. And I started to um, study uh, the Russian Empire when I became professor at the University of Geneva. 
um, I set up this Russia, um, Central and Eastern Europe master's degree. And I thought it was absolutely logical that within that program, we should also have a specific um, course on Ukrainian history. Well, since then, there has been a great deal more known about Ukraine, and a lot of publications have come out all over the world. Um, many people, though, still believe that Ukraine is part of the Russian world, and only an artificial state, um, because of uh, this impact of the official Russian history that many people are still stuck with. Vladimir Putin wanted to be a historian when he took the floor the other day, when because he has been interested in history. Um, since 2003, when he got to power, he actually um, said that um, the more somber um, parts of Russian history should be wiped out of our history books. And uh, that's when uh, people started to talk about Stalin in a more positive light. And Irina um, talked about that very briefly a moment ago. So people started to um, point to his uh, successes. Uh, people started to um, talk about the good things about uh, Russian achievements. And then in 2008, uh, a textbook came out that was, quite frankly, a pro-Stalinist textbook. And uh, thanks to the bravery of all of the scientific community, uh, there has been some resistance. Um, from Memorial, for example, from Marina Shevakova, who've done some amazing work in trying to show that actually the truth was not um, what was being described in these official books. Uh, there were publications that came out, there were some very brave people speaking out in conferences, and that's played a very important role. But since then, there have been, uh, of course, these uh, old uh, squabbles between uh, Russia and Ukraine and the Baltic states, and uh, there is a real um, war of memories now. And uh, we've come to a point of no return now, uh, and uh, I think that these latest events show that. Since 2010, we've talked about uh, the memory of the famine in Ukraine um, uh, and the Second World War and the uh, Germano-Soviet pact in 1939 and the role of nationalisms and, uh, in, in, in the western part of the Ukraine that was part of Poland between the wars and collaborated with the Nazis to a certain extent. Uh, some of those were described in heroic terms by Viktor Yuchenko, which I think was a ter terrible error. Since 2014, we often talk about the Middle Ages, where we saw Rus emerging, this enormous uh, Eastern Slavic state, uh, the capital of which was Kiev. For Vladimir Putin, that state was the cradle of a Russia that includes Ukrainian territory. And uh, even when Rus was disbanded in the uh, 12th century, um, there were close links between Russia and Ukraine. But only in the 17th century did Kiev and part of the current Ukraine fall into uh, Moscow's power. And at the end of the 18th century, practically all of uh, the Ukrainian territory was integrated into Russian territory. The imperial vision always contested the existence of a Ukrainian nation. And what that means is that Ukraine is fighting for its independence by contesting this official Russian discourse that Rus was part of an early Russia. So Russian history books uh, that came out after the end of the USSR in 1991 show how that Russian imperial vision uh, remains very, very strong in Russia today. And what Vladimir Putin said recently in his speech showed that very clearly. The Ukrainian state, he said, was artificially created in 1922 when the USSR was created. Uh, this is, of course, not true. Ukraine was not born at that time with the Bolsheviks. Um, prior to that, there had been um, Ukrainian nationalism, there's a language, there's a culture, there's a territory, and uh, the existence of a nation um, before the existence of a state. So if there hadn't been that national reality in Ukraine, there wouldn't have been a Soviet Ukraine either. In his speech, Vladimir Putin forgot to mention that the Russian Empire was cracking apart um, before uh, that time, and that Ukrainian nationalism had been crushed by force. And in the 1930s, um, uh, national aspirations were crushed uh, in Ukraine and elsewhere. And what Vladimir Putin is saying is that he's defending an imperialist model. 
so of course it was seen as being insulting in U in Ukraine. Russia sees itself as being the, he the, t the head of a civilization. And that's something that Irina Shevardnadze talks about earlier on. Ruski Mir, the Russian world, would be threatened by people in the West who um, uh, the Russians believe they are fighting Russia and uh, trying to bring Russia down, like in 1812, uh, like in 1941. So in Russia's view, Russia includes Ukraine and Belarus, and Belarus is now joining Russia um, because it's totally dependent on it, whereas Russia, whereas Ukraine is resisting. And in Vladimir Putin's view, they are succumbing to the forces of evil, to the forces of the West, to the forces of neo-Nazism. And that's something that we've been hearing in Russia for many years now, even more so since 2014. So Ukraine, would, uh, it's, it claims, has uh, betrayed Russia and it represents a threat to Russia. And that's why it needs to be invaded, uh, even though this would be crushing um, uh, a country that's so close uh, to many Russians' hearts. And in Kharkiv, um, bombs are falling on people who speak Russian. In 2014, Russia lost Ukraine. The Ukrainian identity was therefore strengthened and the Ukrainian language uh, progressed even more in Ukraine. Before uh, 2014, only a minority of Ukrainians uh, wanted Ukraine to join NATO. But the question of NATO became central to Ukraine after 2014, and you can understand why. Today, Russia is no longer seen as a, a, an ally in Ukraine. Uh, it's perceived as a country which is denying Ukraine's very existence. And so that's why these opposing views are getting even more stark, and it's now impossible to go back. Uh, we've reached a point of no return. Uh, and unfortunately, we're seeing now bloodshed, we're seeing deaths, and innocent people being killed. Like all wars, this will end one day, but in the meantime, it will have destroyed the lives of millions of people. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. And I'll let you uh, uh, take your seat, please. Please take a seat. And I'd like to invite all of the panelists to come up to the stage and join us. We're going to hear from them in just a moment. But having heard the historical context, having heard as well from testimonies in Ukraine and in Russia, we've heard some very past personal testimony there as well from uh, Corinne Amacher. I just wanted to talk about this expression, a war of memory, that uh, Corinne Amacher was talking about, because that's something we've been looking at in the festival this year, not only in relation to this conflict, because we weren't expecting this conflict when we, drawn up, when we drew up the program, but in Algeria as well, we were talking about the right to memory and how many memories were hidden uh, for state uh, ideological reasons. So there is a war of memory and there is a right to memory, um, which is something that we've just heard about as well from Corinne. So now everyone's taken their seat. I'd like to introduce all of our panelists. Um, one uh, after the other. And uh, could you just stick to five minutes each uh, when you do take the floor? Because I'm sure we've, we've got a lot of questions in the audience, and uh, I'd like to hear from the audience as well. So I know it's going to be difficult, but um, let's try and be concise. First of all, we have Gilles Carbonnier, who is vice president of the International Committee of the Red Cross uh, and the Red Crescent, the ICRC, who is, of course, very active, uh, which is, of course, very active in Ukraine. As far as you can say, because we know that you must be discreet and uh, work in the background at the ICRC, in your activities or in your organization's activities on the world, on, on, in the field, what can you say about that? Um, thank you, Gaetan. I think the first thing that I have to say is that the testimonies from my colleagues in Mariupol are describing a humanitarian disaster the situation is just unbearable. It's unsustainable. Hundreds of thousands uh, of uh, civilians hiding underground with very little access to water or food, very little access to electricity, or water, uh, or medical care. So the situation in Mariupol is actually um, what 600 colleagues of ours 
are saying in four or five different uh, towns around Ukraine. And it's something that they're saying uh, every day. And we have uh, volunteers in the Ukrainian Red Cross as well who are taking a lot of risks. They're being very brave about it. When they can, they're trying to provide water and food uh, and um, medicines uh, and surgical um, kits to hospitals in Kiev whenever they can. But this is a drop uh, of water in an enormous ocean of needs. And I think um, one thing that's absolutely vital to say is that uh, from a legal point of view, what is quite clear is that the four Geneva Conventions and the additional pr protocol are applicable entirely. They aren't an option to parties to conflict. Um, it's not uh, something that they do as a favor. Civilians must be protected and spared Critical infrastructure must also be spared and um, safe corridors must be provided to allow civilians uh, who wish uh, to flee uh, to flee. And the ICRC um, just wants to remind people of that uh, international law and its job is to um, remind all of the parties to this conflict of uh, the need to respect that law. And it's also vital to try to play our role as a neutral um, arbiter. Whenever we can try to help find solutions with regard to ceasefires, um, for instance, with regard to bringing immediate humanitarian aid to people in, uh, on the ground, and to try and guarantee some basic security for people there. So this is an emergent appeal that we are making um, so that we can work effectively on the ground. I'd also like to say that it's very moving to see how much generosity and solidarity uh, we are seeing. So many people are uh, asking us, what can we do to help? And for me, this makes me feel very optimistic and I understand that uh, desire to help because we're all shocked uh, that this happens in Europe, so close to where we live, and it's such a sudden, brutal um, uh, thing as well. But what we are hearing is unfortunately so similar to what we've heard from millions of civilians who we've been trying to help uh, for many years now in different parts of the, re the world, in the Sahel, in Ethiopia, Yemen, Syria, and so many other places. And uh, I just wish that we would see such solidarity uh, in those situations as well, because um, civilians always suffer in armed conflict. They deserve that uh, solidarity, and they need to be helped. Merci uh, beaucoup et merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. And it was, uh, of course, very important to point that out because um, there are, there is this risk of double standards, um, and I think that does need to be said. Um, I have a question. I'm not sure you'll be able to reply to it uh, uh, fully, but um, of course, you're, there's a lot of work being done to try and create humanitarian corridors. Um, we've heard that that didn't always go to plan that sometimes uh, hor uh, humanitarian corridors uh, brought people across mined roads. Uh, what can you say about that? Uh, are these humanitarian cor corridors going to be possible or not? Well, negotiations are underway uh, uh, between the parties to conflict and will continue to take place. I think on Saturday and Sunday, we thought we had started some civilian evacuations, up to 200,000 from Mariupol, and our colleague delegates there um, tried to launch a convoy for the evacuation, but the conditions were not in place to allow that to happen. Because very quickly, quite apart from the mined roads, hostilities began again, and the fighting broke out uh, again. Um, targeting some of our colleagues, and this is unacceptable. Parties must be much more specific about the exact coordinates of these corridors that they're talking about, so that uh, and the, so that we know exactly when um, they can happen, 
and all parties agree on that, and that these con security conditions are respected. We can offer our services as a, 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 a neutral arbiter, but um, parties are responsible for these agreements, and we can only take the responsibility once parties agree. And we need a much clearer agreement uh, among the parties, not only for issues connected with evacuations, but also to try to provide assistance. Thank you very much, Gilles Carbonnier. Turning now to Gerald Steberock, who is the Secretary General of the World uh, Organization Against Torture, the OMCT. Your mandate um, isn't strictly linked to torture, of course. You also deal with uh, the protection of uh, human rights uh, all over the world and human rights defenders. In U Ukraine and in Russia, um, what can you say about human rights defenders there? There seems to be a lot of work to be done in Russia um, for the exfiltrated, if I can use that word. In the war, in any war situations, truth is the first victim. And there are threats to journalists, as we've heard earlier, and threats to human rights defenders and civil society more broadly. You've perhaps heard that there are rumors that we are hearing that there are lists of people to arrest uh, or potentially to assassinate. And that includes human rights defenders. What I wanted to say was from the point of view of civil society and human rights defenders in Ukraine, Russia, and the region as a whole, we have partners uh, over there. Our organization has a network of more than 200 organizations in the field, including in that region. And some of our colleagues today are participating in the fight, in, in the war. Some of them are also hiding from the bombs. But there is a Ukrainian uh, civil society organizing assistance, orga uh, trying to protect civilians, trying to support refugees, uh, trying to document the human rights abuses that are taking place in the context of this war. We've heard about uh, violations of uh, humanitarian law, but of course you also have in wars torture. In Aleppo, in Grozny, you saw total destruction, but you also see saw torture. And we're going to say the same thing here in Ukraine. Ukrainian civil society is threatened, but it's also trying to be vigilant and trying to continue to work. And there is also a whole network of organizations in Moldo Moldova, Hungary, and Poland who are also organizing support for refugees who are arriving and who are in touch with us to try to build a network that can document uh, human rights abuses that are bound to take place. And that's another area that we need to talk about because we need to talk about accountability, uh, monitoring of human rights abuses. And since you've talked about Russia as well, we heard from a testimony from uh, the coordinator of Memorial. There is a very challenging situation for human rights defenders in Russia for many years now. They do some excellent professional work uh, in practically all areas. But today, there is an immediate threat to them. Uh, the Memorial's office was searched uh, and the director was arrested. And I think it's true that we don't know if uh, human rights associations are going to survive in Russia. There is a real threat, an existential threat to those organizations. And the question for us is what can we do to support civil society in Ukraine and in um, neighboring countries where support is being organized? And what can we do to protect um, human rights defenders in Russia today. Thank you. Among the sanctions that have been taken against Russia, one of them really struck you, and that is sp um, Russian sportsmen and artists seem to be banned. And I think what you were saying earlier is that uh, the basis for emerging from this crisis should be dialogue. And if you cut all links with Russia, how do you expect to resolve the situation? Well, yes, we do need sanctions, and we need a strong 
response. There's no doubt about that. But I'm a child of the Cold War. Um, I grew up during the Cold War. And I was very much struck by people who say that we need a strong response. But, you know, when you have stronger countries just invading the weak, you don't even have the security um, structure that was uh, described in 1975 in Helsinki. And one of the chapters of that was human contacts. That is so important. I think we need strong sanctions. But we also need to think about made, making sure that there are contacts between university um, teachers uh, and, uh, and in civil society. People need to be allowed to leave the country. We need to have humanitarian visas for people who want to leave. And for Belarus, uh, there is another public opinion there. The situation in Bel Belarus is very different because people do have access to European media and international press. Of course, there is repression, so you don't see the demonstrations taking place there. But if you just cut all links with them and you put up an iron curtain, then I just don't think that that is a way to go. I do support sanctions, of course, and I agree uh, with the very strong sanctions that have been taken, even in sporting um, contexts. But we also need to think about how we can have sanctions that also allow those human contacts um, to continue to take place between societies. Thank you. Jerry Simpson. I'd like to give the floor now to Jerry Simpson, who is a Deputy Director of the Crisis and Conflicts Division at Human Rights Watch. Gilles Carbonnier mentioned uh, quite briefly that the events that we are witnessing in Ukraine um, and the acts that have been committed there have also been seen elsewhere, uh, perhaps further away from Europe. And we uh, uh, and politicians in Europe and the media in Europe are reacting differently to the way we reacted when those things took place elsewhere in the world. I'll probably uh, speak in French later on in answering the questions, but if you don't mind, I'll speak uh, English now. Ukraine and other conflicts that we've been researching in recent years. I think the ones that really stand out are the conflicts in Yemen, in Iraq, and in Syria. Um, in terms of what we've seen in Syria, um, Russia and the Syrian authorities have engaged in very similar patterns of um, behavior as we've already seen in the first 12 days here. So we've seen large swathes of civilian neighborhoods being completely destroyed. Um, we've seen significant use of um, weapons that shouldn't be used, like cluster munitions, which Human Rights Watch recently documented. We've seen targeted strikes in Syria and in Ukraine on um, clearly civilian um, locations, such as was, was mentioned in the case of Ukraine, a kindergarten, um, a bakery, I think that was hit earlier today, and we've seen the same pattern in Syria. Schools, hospitals, clinics, bakeries. Places that may have had fighters located in them, but according to the research we've been carrying out for many years, in many cases, no evidence of fighters in those locations, or if there were clearly disproportionate strikes in those areas that may have killed a handful of fighters, but that killed dozens or more civilians. So that's that's a pattern we, we've seen already. Similarly, the, the um, US, UK, French, and other EU nation-backed Saudi-led coalition in Yemen has killed thousands of civilians often in similar circumstances where they've targeted civilian infrastructure, funerals, weddings, school buses, and the like. And uh, the US and UK forces, or US and UK-led coalition in Iraq and Syria, 
um, have repeatedly struck targets where dozens of civilians have been killed, often in very questionable circumstances uh, involving few or no fighters, where mistakes were made potentially, or where a calculation was made that it was okay to kill a serious number of civilians in order to achieve a military aim. And the investigations that have been carried out by Saudi in Yemen and by the US and UK in Syria and Iraq have been significantly lacking. So there are definitely parallels that we see already and that we fear will uh, only get worse with time in Ukraine. Merci beaucoup. C'est évidemment des explications qui ouvrent tout un. Thank you very much. Of course, that opens up a whole series of issues uh, on the narrative that uh, we often hear in one region and how different that is to what we say when it happens in another and how this perhaps can help propaganda. And hopefully we'll be able to come back to that um, issue a little bit later on. I'd like to give the floor to Paul Vallée now, who is a historian and a uh, specialist in uh, American foreign policy, Russia and European foreign policy from the GCSP um, in Geneva, um, GLO, uh, the Geneva Center for Security Policy. This is uh, going to be tough, but you only have five minutes as well. We hear uh, a lot about what Russia is saying about uh, the threat of NATO and uh, the refusal to talk about a new type of European um, security infrastructure following the end of the USSR. What do you think about that? Have the European Union and the US um, taken the wrong path? to promote security in the region. And of course, you're entitled to say you don't know, but um, is there a risk, uh, really, uh, is there a risk that this conflict uh, moves over into other parts of Europe? Thank you very much for your question. I'll try and respond quickly. Ms. Uh, Amacher and our uh, witnesses in Russia and Ukraine have already um, given you some uh, idea about the historical and political narrative uh, by this conflict. But I would point out that there are two uh, there are two streams of thought about um, security in Europe that we've heard for many years now. Uh, there is NATO, which of course uh, dates back to 1949, which survived uh, the end of the Cold War. And there's also the European Union, which from 1992 um, also um, adopted a European defense and security policy. So those two main actors are being targeted by Russia uh, and accused uh, of uh, their post-Cold War extension into Central and Eastern Europe. And what that means is that NATO, which has 30 members, uh, which has described itself as a defensive alliance in terms of its uh, Article 5 and its collective security uh, uh, approach, which is that uh, a def an attack on one party is an attack on all. And for some countries, that is like an insurance policy from foreign aggression. The EU, though, is not a defense or security alliance, but a uh, political integration uh, uh, body. And of course, it requires political solidarity. And with regard to its defense policy, uh, that falls within a very clear legal framework, which was adopted uh, by consensus by the European countries. And it's often described as the Petersburg tasks, basically a peacekeeping uh, in post or pre-conflict situations. Basically, the EU uh, does not have a framework for being involved in situations like we're seeing in Ukraine now. NATO and the EU have, of course, reacted to this crisis in their respective ways. Ukraine uh, is not part of NATO. It has applied 
um, to be a member, but um, it's absolutely not um, happened uh, yet. It will require a unanimous decision on the part of members. And of course, there are members of NATO who have uh, said what Russia has said and that uh, the Ukraine joining NATO would be seen as being a step too far. And therefore, Ukraine uh, so far does not like look like it will be joining NATO. But NATO is now trying to protect the borders of uh, its member states, uh, the Baltic countries, Poland and Romania, uh, which are very close to that region. Uh, they are moving forces into those areas to protect those borders. Most of these uh, troops have been there uh, in small numbers, uh, particularly after the annexation of Crimea. Anyway, there are also uh, planes uh, controlling the territory, but only controlling NATO territory. And as we know, uh, Ukraine over the past few days has been uh, asking for NATO to uh, declare a uh, air exclusion zone in uh, Ukraine, uh, but uh, NATO uh, has not uh, agreed to that uh, demand. Because if it did declare that, that would be uh, to enter into direct conflict with Russian planes. And this would or could lead uh, to a, a widespread war uh, between Europe and uh, Russia. In terms of naval forces uh, in the Black Sea, apart from the units uh, belonging to the coastal states there, uh, Bulgaria, Turkey, uh, NATO, there are no uh, Western ships belonging to NATO in uh, the Black Sea um, since uh, mid-February, so they are not trying to provoke uh, the Russian Navy there either. So at least that is the assurance, uh, uh, the only assurance that NATO can give Ukraine at the moment uh, is probably not enough um, in terms of what they need to defend themselves. And then we'll come back uh, during the discussion to issues connected with uh, arms delivery. But I can't go beyond my five minutes. So, to finish, as we see, the situation is not uh, a situation where NATO could get involved. So, uh, there could be political coordination. And that's what we, we are seeing. We are seeing the member states um, taking a, a range of sanctions, um, targeting the Russian economy. For instance, the decision to uh, cut off about 70% of Russian banks from the SWIFT payment system. That was a decision on the part of the Europeans. In the first few days of the conflict, there was no consensus. There was no consensus about doing that. Um, it's quite clearly the uh, intensification, uh, increasingly brutal nature of the Russian offensive uh, that has convinced uh, countries such as Germany to change their minds um, and support that sanction. Um, and one more thing. Uh, the European Union also has a diplomatic branch. It has a high representative who is responsible for negotiating on the part of the EU. Uh, nuclear negotiations with Iran, for instance. But on this very serious Ukrainian issue, it's a European issue, uh, if ever there was one. But nonetheless, uh, Vladimir Putin's regime has never agreed to um, see uh, the EU's high representative as a legitimate diplomatic uh, uh, appointee. Um, there have been bilateral negotiations between Russia and the US, between uh, uh, Russia and France and Germany. We saw the German Chancellor uh, involved in the Minsk Accords. 
And on each occasion, we've seen how Russia has been trying to get guarantees from the West. As if the West had a mandate uh, to decide uh, for Ukraine what's best for them um, and what's best for Russia. And of course, that's one of the reasons why those negotiations have never been successful. So perhaps I should stop there, uh, even though that's uh, probably quite a negative note to end on. Um, from the point of view of the EU, we are obviously very, very limited in terms of what we can do um, because of these political, legal, and military constraints. Thank you very much. Thank you for those comments. Quite a negative note, yes, uh, not particularly optimistic. Let's hear from our last panelist. Adria boudry Carbo, who is a journalist for Public Eye, uh, a Swiss investigative uh, journal. Uh, he works on Russian money in Switzerland. That's one of his uh, specialisms. And uh, of course, uh, you can't talk about sanctions without talking about the role of the Swiss financial sector, um, which has been used by um, those close to Vladimir Putin and the Russian regime. So perhaps you could just give us uh, a little bit of an idea about those relations between Russia and Switzerland from that point of view. Yes. Good evening. I'm looking into other issues besides Russian money. Um, we were also surprised, though, by this. We talk about um, the curse of commodities, of raw materials. We talk about how raw materials and financial sectors can be used to exploit countries in the south. And a couple of years, a couple of weeks ago, we were struck by this new development, trying to fight uh, the uh, use of the Swiss financial system to aid uh, an invasion of a country in Europe. Russia, though, is a special case of all of the countries we deal with on various continents, Latin America and Africa. There are no countries like Russia who are so, uh, who has so many links with Switzerland. Switzerland is extremely exposed to a Russian risk in many different sectors. Uh, Russia um, exports its economic elite. Oligarchs come and live near uh, the Lake Geneva uh, when they come to buy properties here or hide their money here. That's the first thing I should say. And then secondly, Russian companies since the 2000s, many of them uh, are branches of state enterprises or companies in the hands of oligarchs who have come and set up headquarters here in Geneva, either selling oil or in Zug uh, for minerals or coal. And then the third category are companies that are very close friends of the Kremlin, um, who belong to people very close to Vladimir Putin. Uh, or do a lot of their business in selling uh, Russian energy supplies. So, of course, when these sanctions were adopted, um, a little bit late in Switzerland, as a matter of fact, they are basically focusing on the first category I mentioned, um, so namely individuals close to the Kremlin and uh, Duma uh, parliamentarians who have supported politically the war effort. And of course, some journalists uh, and people working for state enterprises. And then the second category, banks, uh, we're starting to see sanctions against them too. But most banks were spared if they were financing um, the sale of Russian gas, for example. I think we might see that, but uh, in any case, I think you've got a question to ask me. 
Yes, we'll come back to the issue of uh, trading uh, of resources, but uh, I wanted to give uh, the, the, the audience the floor in a moment. But uh, first of all, you talked about very, the ultra-rich, you talked about oligarchs. Being rich and Russian isn't, of course, a crime. So why are some of these people being targeted? Because how do they function in the Putin system? No, we don't just talk about them because they're Russian and rich. We are talking about them and investigating them because they are closely linked to the Kremlin. Their fortune was built up, their wealth was built up in specific circumstances, either in the 90s with the forced privatization of part of the Soviet economy. Some people just suddenly emerged with tremendous wealth from nowhere. As if they were self-made men. Um, and then there's a second category. In the 2000s, when Mr. Putin reached power, where you saw strategic sectors uh, put into the hands of some oligarchs at the expense of others, um, who refused to cooperate because it was a sort of Faustian pact. Of course, I'm not teaching you anything new here, but before Putin, oligarchs sometimes were involved in politics. They had a political voice in the public debate. But once Putin reached power, they agreed to the following. The, the Kremlin won't look into the origins of your wealth if you don't get involved in politics, um, other than perhaps supporting some of the Russian political projects that we have. In 2014, we quite clearly saw people asking the oligarchs to invest in Russia or where they want to influence politics in other countries. You see companies very close to Putin's circle who are prepared to um, give a uh, loan of 10 million to the Front National in France, for example. So that we're not just talking about rich people. We're talking about people who've acquired that wealth in very strange circumstances and perhaps share a value system with Mr. Putin, uh, or at least are very happy with it. Thank you very much indeed for those comments, and I'd like to thank all of the panel for that general background and those comments. Thank you for your patience as well. I think it's high time that we turn to the audience to hear uh, questions from you. Um, if you have any, and I'm receiving some from Bratislava as well, if uh, there aren't any in the room. But are there any questions for any of the members of our panel? Please raise your hand if you have a question, and we'll bring a microphone to you. Okay, now I can see the room. That's even better. No questions? No, very clear? Okay, here we have some hands being raised. Just a moment and we'll bring the mic. Please, go ahead. Allez-y, je crois que... Je crois pas qu'il... Please go ahead. Okay. Um, merci beaucoup pour ces interventions. Thank you very much for your comments. One aspect of this situation, which may not necessarily be strictly linked to human rights, but it's linked to that last uh, intervention, and perhaps more closely linked to the causes of this situation, is, well, you spoke about natural resources, which play a, a very central role to all of this. If I'm not mistaken, since 2012, natural gas was found in uh, Ukraine, which gives the region even more importance in terms of uh, the supply of gas to Western Europe. And perhaps that is also 
Uh, one of the reasons why we are seeing this uh, Russian strategy taking shape today. Do you have any comments about that and about the role of that discovery of natural gas reserves uh, in Ukraine? Thank you very much for this uh, question. I indeed didn't come back on the issue of uh, commodities and commodity trading. What I meant is we need to know where the money comes to finance war. If uh, you're talking about the new um, gas found in the Ukraine, Russia has got many projects in the Arctic with huge oil and gas reserves. And those uh, Russian oil is essentially negotiated and traded from Geneva. More than one third of the national budget in Russia uh, is uh, directly funded from uh, those commodities. So this is uh, quite obvious. This is the elephant in the room. Some people are very close to the Kremlin, and then we uh, putting sanctions on certain banks, and now we're getting to the crux of the matter. Yesterday, the US said they were discussing actively with the Europeans about the possibility of uh, applying an embargo on Russian oil. Is Switzerland going to apply that? Energy is the engine for financing the Russian war. We need to take action to stop giving money to an aggressive state. Yes, coming back to this uh, question of uh, commodities, there are different routes to the conflict. There are historical reasons and geopolitical reasons. The issue of uh, security in Europe, NATO, that might be, according to Russia, threatening Russia. So what is the main cause? Putin has changed his uh, discourse uh, Gradually, and then the morning, the very morning the attack happened, he mentioned all those historical reasons. Is it possible now to exactly know what was the element that started it? Is it a question of security? Is it something else? Do you have an answer? Is there an answer? A micro pour Paul, merci beaucoup. Uh, oui, alors, il y a, il y a... Of course, uh, there's the, the historical controversy and the issue of uh, NATO enlarg enlargement for a number of years now. There is a recurring argument, uh, the idea of a promise that had been made to Mikhail Gorbachev towards the end of the Cold War, a promise made by the Americans. Of course, what doesn't help is that uh, history in Russia and uh, historical researchers has been uh, gravely handicapped Therefore, we cannot have proper access to Russian sources. We do have access to Russian, uh, to American sources. And for a number of years, because of that controversy, uh, there have been uh, people writing, trying to investigate who had been saying what and whether it had any, any kind of uh, value. No agreement was signed between the US and the Russian Federation. There was no agreement at the time of the 2 plus 4 agreement and the German reunification when um, 
the promise is supposed to have to have been made a promise not to go beyond East Germany. But let's recall that uh, it was just uh, verbal reassurance in a special context when there were almost 300,000 so, um, Russian soldiers in Germany and uh, they got reassurances that uh, no tanks would go beyond Czech Pond Charlie on the following day. Of course, we've uh, talked a lot about uh, European security architecture. Of course, the disaggregation of the USSR, which was voted by the members of the Warsaw Pact, a pact that had been imposed by Russia in '64, contrary to the uh, NATO um, enlargement that happened later on. It, when a country joins NATO, it is by a choice. Spain joined NATO in uh, 82 after, uh, after the end of the dictatorship, only became a full member of the alliance in the 1990s. And France came back as a full member of NATO in 2008. So there are different alliances and different regimes. So coming to your point, um, would Russia join the alliance that was never really an issue. It would be too large a country. It's a very big stakeholder. Of course, Central and Eastern European uh, countries very quickly uh, wanted to join, but they didn't get to actually joining NATO immediately. Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic were the first ones towards the end of the 90s because they had moved on a lot in a political transition, a social economic transition, and were fulfilling all the requirements to be members of NATO. And they were in parallel preparing to join the EU, which happened later on in 2004. So maybe there is some confusion uh, in part of the Russian people, and uh, more particularly in people in power in Russia, who consider uh, EU uh, joining the EU or joining the NATO as exactly the same thing. EU is a partnership agreement, and it is very similar to uh, what uh, uh, Russia has actually signed up with the EU itself, a partnership agreement. So, yes, maybe um, there were some mishaps uh, in the way the relationship was managed between EU and Russia. On the other hand, one cannot say that there was a, no dialogue. A bit like the red phone during the Cold War. There's always been a link, although it was slightly suspended during uh, when, when Crimea was invaded. But this is not enough. And on the other side, Russia has always been talking about the security treaty in Europe, which is quite interesting. And of course, it's a treaty that 
presupposes the adoption of a neutrality policy by a number of countries. Can you please come to your conclusion? Yes, and people also mentioned the example of uh, Swiss neutrality. But can we ask some countries in the long term to commit to neutrality and deny them any kind of possibility of changing policy if there is a democratic choice to do otherwise. Sorry, I've been very long. Thank you. Thank you. This was still a very interesting answer. We've got two questions from Bratislava. Please try to be brief. So the first question is relatively simple. How do we manage all of the refugees that are coming and will continue coming? And a second question, do we need to fear another world war? So coming to the issue of refugees, who would like to answer? Jerry. I'm going to go back to English again, if you don't mind. Um, the European Union agreed on the 3rd of March, or the 4th, I forget now, it seems like a long week now, <laughs> to um, invoke what's called the Temporary Protection Directive, which um, <clears throat> means that European Union member states don't have to process people through the usual asylum process procedures. So anyone that can show that they're a Ukrainian national <laughs> uh, or somebody in a comparable situation to a Ukrainian national, whatever that means, coming from Ukraine, has the right to remain in the European Union. And it's um, the first time that directive has been um, invoked since it was um, um, adopted in 2001. That's a very interesting um, development. It stands, just as an aside, if I can, I'll try and answer that question more fully in a second, but it does stand in contrast to the response that Europe gave, um, with the exception of Germany, I would say generally, uh, in 2015. And it really is striking when you look at social media and you look at the media more generally, the level of emotion that is expressed towards people fleeing the Ukrainian conflict compared to the level of emotion that has been shown towards Afghans, Iraqis, and Syrians, um, most of whom have valid asylum claims, uh, including Afghans, when you look at the, per the percentages. Um, it is very striking contrast. Um, in March 2016, the EU signed an agreement with Turkey to stop Syrians from entering the EU. And that very same week, the Turkish border guard started killing Syrian asylum seekers, women, children, men. Uh, Human Rights Watch was the first organization to document that in detail, and we continue to document it for many years. There was almost no commentary in the Western press about Turkish border guards killing Syrian asylum seekers in large numbers and pushing back, and it's not an exaggeration, tens of thousands and possibly hundreds of thousands at the Syrian border between 2016 and 2020, and ongoing now, in fact. So the, the, it is a very interesting response. However, I do agree with your comments earlier. It is extremely good to see that there is this outpouring of empathy and support, and it will be interesting to see what kind of um, um, precedent this will set for e European responses in the future to other refugee flows, um, wherever they may come from. Merci pour cette, uh, très sincère Thank you very much for this very sincere answer. That shows that a very simple question can open up a, a very interesting issue. Then the other question from uh, Bratislava, do we need to fear another world war? Who wants to try and answer? Nobody really, I understand. I'll turn to the public again. Does anyone want to ask a question in the public? Yes, good evening. The 
International Criminal Court prosecutor has opened an investigation for war crimes under an accelerated procedure. He didn't wait for the court to uh, open up a case through the agreement of the member countries. I'm sure evidence will be gathered in the field by the different organizations, uh, journalists, uh, citizens in the Ukraine. Is it a way for the prosecutor to secure evidence and to have evidence that would be uh, used later on? So that's my first question. Second question. Is that investigation something that could frighten Vladimir Putin? Because the investigation covers Russia as well as U uh, Ukraine, because there is suspicion of war crime in Donbass. So do you think that is going to um, put Putin off or not? Vous n'y échappez pas, Gérald. Gérald. <laughs> Vous répondrez après. It's a very interesting question and one I wish you, you, you had an hour to discuss. Um, I think what is very striking is the speed. First of all, I think it was 39 countries referred the situation to the uh, International Criminal Court, which is a is unheard of. Uh, there are various ways to refer a situation to the court. Um, sometimes other countries do that, but it's rare and it's it's, un it's unheard of that 39 countries do that. So the, the speed with which Russia was referred to the prosecutor was, was um, incredible. Um, and it, it would, again, going back to the refugee answer, wouldn't it be nice if that happened in other cases, <laughs> including in relation to UK crimes when they're not properly prosecuted in the UK, or US crimes, or French crimes, wherever they may occur, or other powerful countries committing uh, abuses that aren't properly prosecuted in their own countries. The, the International Criminal Court only steps in when countries fail to prosecute their own soldiers adequately for crimes they've committed. Um, so it's very striking. On your specific question of whether the purpose is to secure evidence, um, because the court has acted so quickly, it can now use resources to put together investigation teams who can spearhead um, the, uh, the, the collection of evidence, and it can cooperate with other initiatives, for example, the Commission of Inquiry that was just set up by the Human Rights Council in Geneva into abuses committed in Russia. That was approved uh, three days ago or so. Um, so there's, there the court can work with, for example, the Human Rights Council in Geneva. Um, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, FIDH, journalists would do their own investigations regardless. And in many situations, including where the court does not have jurisdiction, we still go out and we try and document these crimes both in case the court does end up with jurisdiction, but also for the purpose of prosecutions under what is known as the principle of universal jurisdiction, which you may be familiar with, especially here in Switzerland, under which countries, prosecutors, can um, order the arrest, detention, and trial of war criminals and other suspects um, who may have committed serious international crimes regardless of where the crime was committed, who the victim is, and whether or not the victim is in Swiss territory, in the case of Switzerland. And Switzerland is one of the trailblazing countries on that front, um, together with a number of other European countries. So um, even when the court doesn't get involved in The Hague, um, countries can prosecute criminals regardless. Thank you very much. Is there anything else that you want to add to that? Yes, I think you've said everything about the International Criminal Court, but I think it's also important to say, because there are so many claims being made, um, the UN is responsible for some of these issues. I think the uh, Human Rights Council Commission of Inquiry is also very important because they are there to document any human rights abuses that will take place. Um, and I think the ICC prosecutor was hoping that opening up an investigation um, would uh, perhaps make the Russians think twice 
about what they were doing. But I'm not quite sure that that's going to happen. And I think we all have responsibility to support those who are trying to document uh, abuses. Uh, and it might take some time to see any accountability, but uh, I think that's the only way. Thank you. Anything to add, Gilles Carbonier? Yes, very briefly. Just to say that um, the ICRC has teams in the field, and we are trying to assess the way in which the war is being waged, the humanitarian impact, and of course, it's not up to the ICIC to collaborate with the conflicting parties. But what we're trying to do is make sure that uh, people in capitals uh, are aware of what's going on and document uh, these things, but also in, uh, try to encourage dialogue on the basis of international humanitarian law and ask parties to be accountable. So that's a very important aspect of our work. Of course, we are confidential and we hope to be constructive and support the parties over time because this conflict may last for some time. I also wanted to underscore the importance of avoiding double standards. The same rules have to apply wherever armed conflict takes place. Takes place. Non-international. Of course, there are differences between non-international and international uh, conflicts, but we need to be consistent, and that's something that we try to do uh, in the ICRC when we talk with parties of conflict. I think for, uh, with regard to, to uh, the, the question of refugees, you said it all, Jerry, so uh, I don't have much to add. We have our teams, especially of, uh, you know, national Red Cross societies, volunteers on all the, in all the countries bordering, trying to, to provide support. But what I want to say is that uh, when we hear that there are distinction being made with some foreigners, including for uh, foreign and, and for that sake, African students uh, trying also to um, to flee the fighting and, and, and arrive there, I think it's important in these circumstances to show consistency in the generosity that is uh, that is displayed for for uh, people seeking refuge. Merci beaucoup pour cette précision. Thank you very much for that point as well. Uh, a very interesting um, additional element in Ukraine is the number, there are four nuclear power stations in Ukraine with 15 reactors. You saw one of them was hit by potentially shelling or other fire a few days ago. Um, the, in, the Rome Statute that the International Criminal Court um, adjudicates on includes crimes against the environment. It's quite narrow, but there are very original ways one can use other crimes, uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity included, in order to um, prosecute actions that damage the environment and harm the environment, including because the harm is so massive in the long term, affecting tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of people. So if a nuclear power station is attacked and radiation escapes, if oil wells, gas pipelines, and other heavy industries, which Ukraine has many of, are attacked and cause widespread environmental harm and therefore harm to human health and life, those crimes are justiciable um, under the Rome Statute um, by the International Criminal Court. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much indeed. Well, it's 10 p.m. already, and I see some people have already left. Can we take one last question? Um, uh, one last question before we conclude. No, je ne vous entend pas, Ouguerre. I'm afraid we can't hear you. Un, deux, trois. Ah voilà, c'est bon. Je vous en prie, on vous écoute, on vous entend. Please go ahead. I'm sorry for being naive, but why isn't war forbidden? <laughs> you want to say something? You are ready for that? 
there are two there are two uh, areas of law in that respect. One is the right to war, and the other is the right right law in war. Um, and the, I won't repeat the Latin because I was terrible at Latin. And I always get them mixed up. But the yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the. Um, the, the, the question of whether this war is legal is uh, a, a very strongly debated one. Um, Human Rights Watch doesn't take a position ever on when a, 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 a war is legal for a range of reasons, including quite practical ones, uh, also including in terms of whether or not we're deemed to be political as an organization as opposed to looking at how wars are fought and whether the laws of the war are, are followed. But it's just to flag, there is a, a lively debate around that, and there are people that will argue very vociferously that this is a war of aggression. It can't be ruled on by the International Criminal Court because neither Ukraine nor Russia have signed up to the relevant part of the Rome Statute that um, deals with that question. But um, uh, it, it, could be, it could be argued to be a war of aggression, and people will argue that. And if it is found to be a war of aggression by, by some other jurisdiction, it would be termed an unlawful war. Qui n'était donc pas si ingénu. Sur cette dernière question, merci beaucoup à nos Thank you very much for that uh, very last question. Thank you to our panelists for having replied to the questions. And uh, enjoy the rest of your evening.